trust there is still so much unrest in our hearts. We light a candle of peace.
seminar on greenhouse gas emissions and environmental goals. And I was so impressed and joyful that here at Grand Junction, 43% of the energy we use is renewable green sources. I did not know that. I would have guessed 15%. 43%. So some of the leaders here are doing something right. And that's something to celebrate. Peace to the Lord. In concerns, we continue to pray for those who are still waiting to be freed as hostages held by Hamas. And we pray for peace in the Middle East, knowing it is a very long and difficult path. Peace to the Lord. Who has a joy or concern to share? Today we're using this mic because the other mic is out of order. So, who has a joy or concern to share? I forgot a party. On um, the 16th at noon is the Women's Christian Christmas Luncher. And um, that's three parties in one day. So, we like everybody to sign up for this. Yes, I probably forgot that because I wasn't invited. So. <laughs>
but we do not study history. We do not realize that scapegoating Jewish people is a very, very old evil in Western civilization. We pray for people in Gaza who never want a war and seek only peace and security. Let peace be born. When our eyes see that every human being wants the same thing, food and shelter, peace and safety, acceptance and meaningful lives. We pray this as we follow in the steps of Jesus who taught us to pray by saying, Our Creator, you are in heaven, your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And we us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
startling truth. It reads as follows. We, this people, on a small and lonely planet, traveling through casual space, past the loose stars, across the way of indifferent suns, to a destination where all the signs tell us. It's possible and imperative that we learn a great and startling truth. And when it comes to us, that day of peacemaking, when we release our fingers from fits of hostility and allow the pure air to cool our palms, when we come to it, when the curtain falls on the menstrual show of hate and faces suited with store are scrubbed clean, when battlefields and coliseums no longer break our unique and particular sons and daughters up with bruised and bloody grass to lie in identical plots in foreign soil. When we come to it, we will let the rifles fall from our shoulders and children dress their dolls in flags of truth. When landmines of death have been removed and the aged can walk into evenings of peace. When the nightmares of abuse are gone. Out of such chaos, out of such contradiction, we learn there are neither devils nor divines. When we come to it, we, this people, on this wayward floating body created on this earth, of this earth, have the power to fashion this world. A climate where every man and every woman can live freely, without sanctimonious piety, without crippling fear. When we come to it, we must confess that we are the possible. We are the miraculous, the true wonder of this world. That is when, and only when, we come to it. Amen.
microphone for Tim. Plus, I wanted everyone to see what he was wearing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think in the Christmas spirit, I don't know what I wear. So, Tim? <laughs> Thank you, Tim. <laughs> when I first scanned the first um, passage, I could have sworn I saw my cardiologist's name. It's Dr. Azuz. So, so if I stumble and say it, say the wrong name, you'll understand. The readings are from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, in days to come, the mount of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning books. Nation shall not lift up sword against <coughs> nation, neither shall they learn, for, learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Second passage is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 6. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them the light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exalt when dividing plunder for the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all boots of the trampling warriors and all garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and, his, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Some of us 
we can remember parts of our life living not during a hot war, but during a cold war that lasted 40 years and now seems to be reviving once again with a new empire in Russia. But the Cold War that we said was a time of peace wasn't really a time of peace. If you lived through the McCarthy era and you knew about Dalton Trumbo, was that a time of peace in our culture? What about Korea? Was that a time of peace? Of course, the show MASH lasted three times as long as the war, but it was better than war. Vietnam, was that a time of peace? No. Oftentimes what we call peace is not peace at all. The peace between nations is often a time when they're simply too weak to fight. If you study history, World War I ended with Germany being decimated and losing basically the entire generation of young men. Twenty years later, there's a reloading. The treaty in World War I created such animosity and brutality and burdens placed upon Germany that it created resentment. And guess what? When people feel resentment, they vote for political extremes. That ever happened? <laughs> it happens. When people feel resentment, they vote for extremes. So most often what we call peace is not peace. It's a time when like two boxers have beat each other to a pulp and one goat becomes unconscious. We call that peace. It's not peace. It's just unconsciousness until the next boxing match. So Isaiah talks about peace, and Jesus talks about peace in a very different way than how we understand peace as the absence of two nations fighting each other. When we look at peace in the Bible, we see it connected to the birth of Jesus to say there's a different way of peace than the world's peace. There is a peace that has to begin within the human soul. Jesus was born in the Roman Empire, which declared the wonderful achievement of peace. Pax Romana. How many remember that from civics class? The peace of Rome. And that was the definition that we have often adopted of peace. Now what was Pax Romana? Pax Romana was this, that Rome had beaten down every other nation they could. And that was their definition of what? Peace. That the army is there controlling <laughs> the territory and you're paying taxes to Rome that often run as high as 80%. And that this was global peace. Was it peace if you walk down the street and you see the Romans with swords and spears waiting for you to step out of line? That's not the peace that Isaiah is talking about. And we often forget that the cross itself was the instrument of Roman execution and, yes, terrorism, because they would place the crosses on public roads. So you had to walk by them on your normal journeys. And that was to send a message subliminally, if you didn't catch it, obviously, don't mess with Rome, because their way of peace is very, very brutal. The Roman Empire didn't need planes or missiles or bombs or guns to create fear and trembling to create peace with oppression. This church was so lucky to host John Dominic Cross a few years back because he's the expert on talking about the two models of peace. We use the word peace at Christmas, but it's talking about an entirely different thing than Pax Roman. In fact, Cross and argues that the reason the gospel was written as it was written was to draw a contrast between the politics of Caesar Augustus, the politics of Rome, and this baby born in the middle of nowhere in Bethlehem, how can this be the Prince of Peace? <coughs> What's he going to do to bring peace? How is he going to take on Rome? And John Dominic Crossan says, look at the deeper message. The deeper message is that 
worldly peace is temporary. And there are always going to be nations fighting nations. The birth of this child is talking about a different type of peace. A peace that has to be born within our hearts, our souls, our consciousness. Part of the reason that I'm involved in interfaith dialogue now for four decades is to build a basis of peace between people of faith. And yes, politics can get in the way of that. But here's what you find when you talk with people of other faiths, is that they have the same hopes, dreams, and fears that we do. You meet on a common ground. And where you find the overlap, where you find the experience of peace is in two things. First, the experience of silence beyond words. When you have a time of meditation together, there's no Christian meditation, Buddhist meditation in times of silence. There's just presence of being together. And there's a sense when you hear others breathing of how much we hold in common. Just human beings breathing together in different spaces, in different places in our life, but together in silent meditation. When we look at how monks connect, it's very interesting. The great mystic monk Thomas Merton, a Catholic, met with the Dalai Lama. And this would have been back in 1967. And it said they both recognized each other as kindred spirits. Why? Because they spent decades planting the seeds of peace within. That they recognized in each other a mirror image beyond all the superficial differences between Tibetan Buddhism and Roman Catholicism. They saw in each other a deeper peace that came in many, many years of silent meditation practice. Now, for some of us, that's hard, and it's difficult, and it gives us busy brain. So the second pathway to interfaith harmony and to build peaceful relationships is simple one that we can all appreciate. It's called food. <laughs> Sharing food together. If nothing else it raises your blood sugar and you feel less hungry, it's hard to be hypercritical when you're enjoying a good meal together with those of a different faith group. And you may even discover that you like the food they have created for you. I've been to many different temples and I've never had one where I said, well, I can't eat that. <laughs> it's a case where sharing food together is a beautiful expression of life. Even when we get to the meditation place, we often just use different words for the same experience of life. For example, Christians talk about the peace of God, where Hindus would say that is called moksha, and Buddhists would say that's called satori, and Muslims would say that's called fana, and it's all talking about the letting go of the self to be aware of the broader universe, to be aware of the gifts of God. So true peace, is beyond our debates, our symbols, our theologies, our difficulties, and we talk about, well, we don't believe that, or we do believe this. True peace happens when we listen to each other as human beings, as basic living beings, one with another. And that's also why food works, because most of us like food and enjoy the company of others in sharing that food. It is a beautiful gift to invite people of other faiths into our homes for holiday seasons. Or to go when you're invited to a Hanukkah celebration. Go when you're invited to a celebration of Buddha's birthday. Go and share in that moment. Two different ways of peace. Romans believe peace comes when you have swords and spears and armies. God creates peace in hearts, minds, and spirits. The Roman way of peace involves crosses along roadsides. God's way of peace involves justice, mercy, compassion, and sharing. The words of the prophet Isaiah are words of 
judgment against every nation that has ever fought a war. Isaiah sees a different way. He sees a path that is God's way towards peace, and he prays for the day. And every kiss we've never experienced, and we've never experienced, when nations will beat their swords into plowshares <coughs> and their spears into pruning hooks. When nations will not take up sword against nation or train for war anymore. God's peace is not about human empires. Sometimes we interpret things too literally. I've heard people say, well, taking God's name in vain is what happens if you drop a bowling ball on your foot or hit your thumb with a hammer. No, that's not taking God's in name. That's name in vain. That is a reflex action. How many of you in the dark have stubbed your toe to the point that it was either sprained or broken? If you use God's name to be made in that situation, you're forgiven. <laughs> That's not using God's name in vain. Using God's name in vain is saying that God wants war and destruction. That's using God's name in vain. Saying that God invites war and destruction is using God's name in vain. Some of you who study history realize how evil happens when we start merging ideas of church and state together. We're thinking that churches should run states. Anyone know what the bell buckle of Nazi soldiers said? Gott mit uns. Well, somebody knows who said it. Yeah. Gott mit uns. Yes. That translates God with us. That was on the Nazi bell buckles that they wore into battle. It was a lie, a falsehood, an untruth. So when we think about how we get confused, political empires are not the peace of God. People who say separation of church and state is a bunch of junk are dangerous and delusional. The prophet Isaiah and the angel's declaration of the birth of Jesus says that peace is a different path. But it has to begin within the human soul. And when we blur the lines between being a Christian and being an American, we have a situation of idolatry. Linking the finite with the infinite. We celebrate the birth of a child of peace. Jesus was not called to be the emperor of Rome and was not born in the emperor's palace, which is the whole point of reading the birth narratives. Jesus had a way of peace that had nothing to do with military power and national security. Jesus would never run for president. Jesus <clears throat> never wanted to be dictator, even for a day. His way had nothing to do with power over others, which is how we often define peace. Peace is about letting go of the temptation to build empires and create empires for our small self. Peace is finding the still waters where we renew our souls. Peace is letting go of the need to control the stars, the sun, the moon, and everyone around us. Peace is an acceptance of our own limitations. Peace was found in the quiet of the night of shepherds who were the rejects of their society simply listening for the word of goodness and grace in their life. Peace was found by mad guys looking at the night sky in search of a better way. Advent is a call to follow the one who realized that peace is so different from how we define it. We pray for peace. We work for peace.
peace between nations. We hope for peace in this terrible situation in the Middle East. At the same time, we acknowledge that our way of faith is a different type of peace. A peace that is born within us. A peace that helps us to see, to love, to feel, and to share. And that peace is a peace that no nation can ever fully experience. 